Armando Hasurungan, Biology and Medicine videos, please make sure to subscribe, join the forum and group. For the latest videos, please visit Facebook Armando Hasurungan. In this video, we're going to look at iron physiology. Now, iron is an essential element, metal, that we need in our body to perform many physiological processes. We get our iron by eating food. Our, dietary, our daily dietary requirement of iron is between 10 to 20 milligrams. So here I'm drawing iron as Fe3+, because Fe is the chemical symbol for iron, elemental symbol for iron. Iron is, goes down the esophagus into the stomach and then will travel into the small intestine where it will be absorbed. Before we continue on, we have to know that in our bodies we have two main forms of iron. We have the ferrous iron, Fe2+, and the oxidized iron, ferric iron, Fe3+. Anyway, let's go back to the small intestine here and zoom in. So here we have the lumen of the small intestine. And here I'm drawing the intestinal cells known as enterocytes. So iron is, is, travels through the stomach and arrives in the lumen of the small intestine. It's in a Fe3 plus form, a ferric iron form, because this is usually the form it comes in when we take, uh, consume iron. But the thing is, we cannot actually absorb iron in the ferric form. It has to be converted to ferrous iron. And so what happens is we have an enzyme on the top of our enterocytes, on the apical surface, known as vitamin C ferroreductase. Um, and to add to this, on the apical side, we also have a, uh, the iron transporter, you can say, known as the divalent metal transporter 1, or DMT1 for short. And this is a co-transporter. So the ferric iron gets reduced by vitamin C ferroreductase to the ferrous iron. And then it's in the ferrous iron form that it is able to be absorbed by the enterocyte through the DMT1 uh, channel. And the DMT1 is a co-transporter, so hydrogen is also taken in. So this ferrous iron, what happens to it? Well, the ferrous iron can be oxidized back to ferric iron. Iron that is stored in cells are stored as ferritin, Fe3+, or ferric iron. The ferrous iron, Fe2+, can uh, also be transported to other cells around the body, to the liver and to the bone marrow. Iron leave the cell through the basal surface through a transporter called ferroportin or IREG1. Iron has to be converted to the ferric form in order to, um, in order to be transported around. And so once outside here, an enzyme, hephastin, converts the ferrous form into the ferric form. Here I'm drawing the circulation, the blood. Within the blood, we can find uh, red, red blood cells here, erythrocytes, the mature red blood cells. We also find many protein carriers. One such carrier protein that we have to know is called transferrin. When transferrin is not bound to anything, it's known as apotransferrin. But the role of transferrin is to transport iron around the body, as iron is unable to travel by itself. So here we have transferrin bound to two ferric irons. So transferrin carries two ferric irons around our body through via blood. So what are the fates of these irons? Well, they have two main fates, main fates. Most of these iron goes into erythropoiesis in the bone marrow, the production of red blood cells. About 75% of the iron absorbed goes into the production of erythrocytes. So here we have erythrocytes with transferrin receptors. And why does red blood cells need iron? Well, iron is used for hemoglobin to carry oxygen. And once iron is used by the um, pre-red blood cells, the, the pre-red blood cells can then become mature, mature red blood cells and enter circulation. 
Transferrin can also transport some of the iron, about 10 to 20 percent, to the liver. So the transferrin will bind onto the transferrin receptor, which will allow the iron to enter the liver, and then the liver can then store iron, if you remember, in the ferric form, as ferritin. Now let's have a closer look at how transferrin binds to the transferrin receptor on the cells, and how iron is stored within the, these cells. So let's zoom into this area here. Here we have the intracellular fluid of the liver cell, and then we have the extracellular fluid of the liver cell. Here we have transferrin bound, uh, which has two ferric irons on each of them. And here we have our transferrin receptor on the outer cell membrane. When two transferrin molecules bind onto the transferrin receptor, this will cause the transferrin receptor to um, endocytize uh, these, the, the two transferrin, forming a vesicle. When the vesicle has formed, hydrogen ions will then enter the vesicle, causing a decrease in pH within the vesicle. A decrease in pH will cause the expression of the divalent metal transporter. As well, the decrease in pH will cause the ferric, iron, ferric irons to detach from the transferrins. And so here we have the ferric iron detached from the transferrin, and we have here the DMT being expressed. The ferric iron will be reduced back to ferrous to be released into the cytosol, to carrying a hydrogen with it. The ferrous iron can then be oxidized back to ferric iron and then be stored as ferritin within the liver cell in this case. The vesicle containing the transferrin molecule and the receptor will slowly make its way to the outer cell membrane and fuse with the outer cell membrane where it will release the transferrin back into circulation. So here, as I've drawn in the liver, iron is stored as ferritin. The liver can also release um, iron back into circulation through the ferroportin transporter. And the iron is released into circulation bound to transferrin as well. Now that we've learned how iron is absorbed, how iron is stored, and how iron is released into circulation, let us learn at what factors regulate iron concentrations in plasma. Hepcidin is the master iron regulator and is produced and secreted by the liver. Hepcidin enters circulation and has many functions. Its main function is to um, inhibit essentially the function of ferroportin, which are the transporters um, that play a role in iron release into circulation. So hepcidin prevents iron to be released into circulation, and therefore its main goal is to decrease plasma iron concentrations. Hepcidin also functions um, on the spleen macrophages. Why is this? Well, if we zoom into the spleen, we know that the spleen contains many macrophages. Now, when a red blood cell becomes old or becomes damaged, the red blood cell will enter the spleen, and then these splenic macrophages will then engulf this damaged or old red blood cell and digest it. It will digest it into smaller, its smaller materials, um, one of which is iron. Iron then can be released back into circulation and be recycled for erythropoiesis in the bone marrow. However, hepcidin will block ferroportin and therefore block the release of iron into circulation, thereby decreasing plasma iron concentrations. Hepcidin not only works on ferroportin, but it also inhibits the absorption of iron from the lumen of the small intestine. So that is important to know. So what stimulates hepcidin release? Well, inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-6 will stimulate hepcidin production and release. An increase in plasma iron concentration, well iron bound to transferrin, will stimulate hepcidin release because hepcidin will then um, reduce or decrease plasma iron concentration. 
Some bacterial components or pathogen components such as lipopolysaccharides will also stimulate hepcidin production. But the main regulator of hepcidin production is the HFE protein. Now, the HFE gene, also known as the hemochromatosis gene, makes the HFE protein. What does the HFE protein do? Well, the HFE protein will interact with other proteins to regulate iron absorption through the production of hepcidin. If there was a mutation in the HFE protein, so a mutation of the HFE gene will actually result in a disease known as hereditary hemochromatosis. And this disease is where you have iron overload, when you have too much iron in the tissues. So how would a mutated HFE protein result in iron overload in tissues? Well, to understand this, we have to flash back and remember what hepcidin does. Remember, hepcidin blocks ferroportin transporter here. And it also prevents the absorption of iron from the intestine. Its sole goal is to decrease plasma iron concentration. Okay, but if HFE protein doesn't work, that means hepcidin will not work. And therefore, hepcidin cannot prevent or inhibit the absorption of iron from the small intestine. And therefore, the body will absorb a lot of iron from the intestine. And so you have excess iron in tissues. And this can lead to uh, severe consequences. I hope that made sense. Now, iron does not all come from vegetables or meat. Iron also comes from hemoglobin and myoglobin, which are found in red blood cells. So hemoglobin in the intestine can be broken down to heme and globin by digestive enzymes. The heme can be absorbed by the enterocyte through a transporter, possibly HCP1. The heme is a component of the red blood cell that contains iron. Heme in enterocytes is oxidized to bilirubin and iron, and therefore iron can then be stored as ferritin, H, which is the ferric form. Some things to point out in this diagram is the divalent metal transporter 1, DMT1, which is important in the absorption of iron. But DMT1 is also responsible for the absorption of other metals, including zinc, zinc copper, um, and cobalt, amongst many other things. Also, if you, have, if you do not eat enough iron or consume enough iron or don't have enough iron in your body, you can suffer from iron deficiency, which leads to anemia or iron deficient anemia. Menstrual bleeding is the major root of iron loss in women, and therefore women typically require 50% more iron than men. So that concludes the video on iron physiology. I hope you really enjoyed it. If it was too confusing, I hope you can watch it again and try to understand it, I guess. Thank you. Bye.